and also we need to learn to respect others because if we can establish uh, mutual respect and tolerance for each other, we can preserve our different cultures. Although there might be like language barriers. Appreciation and cultural appropriation. Sorry, uh, one apology. Could you explain what those terms mean? There's a balance in between that because with diversity we have differences. But when we try to accept each other, we kind of fall into this one line. We, we be coherent, right? So there's a point in which we can be diverse and we can show our true identity and at the same time preserve that identity. So that so finding that balance is exactly what embracing social diversity is. Knowing that you you are in a community, but you're also in a in a group. And being in that group, you will want to understand other groups. Get what get what you need from them, and also give what they need, what they need to them. Something like that. So thank you, delegation of Malaysia. Next, we will invite the delegates of Indonesia to tell us more about the move towards environmental protection. Good evening everyone to the facilitators of the APYLS 2018, teachers and fellow delegates. My name is Anya and along with my teammates Ablar, Vidya and Nikos, we represent Indonesia and we are here today to discuss with the fellow delegates about our topic, Move Towards Environmental Protection. First, let me ask you this question. What exactly defines the environment? Well, the environment can be defined as two things. First, the environment is the surrounding or condition where humans, animals, and plants live in and operate in. The second definition is the environment is the natural world, in particular a geographical area where human activity affects it. This shows how important the environment is for human life because the human life system really depends on the environment. And the degradation of the environment can be caused by things like the slowing population, the increase of energy use, mass migration to cities, and increasing carbon emissions. According to the WWF, the environment is growing worse every day. Among, currently, Indonesia is ranked fourth place among top 10 countries that are considered majorly contributing to the degradation of the environment. Now the key, oh sorry. And now on this slide you can see the increase of global carbon emissions from the year 1900 to 2014, with the most rapid increase being from 1950, 1960s to 1970, 1980s. And we believe that this is because of the swelling population, the increase of demand for necessities has grown, and therefore the development of technology is is urged is the development of technology has been pushed because um, in order to satisfy the needs of the Islamic population. And now the key issues will be discussed by Daniel. In discussing the topic of moving towards environmental protection, two key issues exist. In implementing environmental laws focus on how certain rules and regulations support environmental protection where they emphasize the need to protect it. Also the harmful actions done against them. And examples of these rules and regulations in Indonesia are the Constitution of the Republic of Indonesia, number 41 of the year 1999, which states that illegal logging is a crime and completely different sentence. Other two constitutions are the number 45 of the year 2004, as well as number 34 of the year 2002. It is also important to know that different countries may require different strategies to implement these laws simply because of different geographical conditions as well as different levels of intensity and not the problem in the country itself. However, these laws must be both manageable and above all achievable. 
and international law must be applicable to all countries different, despite the regulations. Uh, the second pivotal issue is raising environmental awareness. It is very, it is, it is a primary requirement simply because in the end, if, no matter of protecting the environment, it depends on us. It is our actions that define our ways of either protecting the environment or destroying it. And we believe that by raising awareness, more and more people will step up and protect the environment, and these may be realized in their related activities, such as optioning not to use less, less, uh, optioning to use less, less. We will now take a look at some of the case studies in Indonesia. Deforestation has been a national problem. It has been ongoing for more than four decades. Indonesia has one of the most extensive rainforests in the world, but in 2020, which is two more years, we are expected to lose more than 70% of our forest because of deforestation. These forests are deforested because they are trying to improve oil and rubber tall as well as all plantations and to and for both industrial and commercial industries. Its effects cannot be ignored as they include the loss of natural habitats and resources, the increasing air pollution which also worsens the environment, as well as the increasing risk in forest fire. Uh, these are pictures of the Sumatran forest in Indonesia in the province of Riau. As you, can, as you all can see, most parts of the forest has been deleted, and these pictures show how prominent the issue is in Indonesia. I will now introduce my friend Abelard to continue with other case studies in Indonesia. Thank you, Daniel. And let us talk a bit more about forest fire. Forest fire in Indonesia has been a prominent issue for around two decades. And in 2015 alone, approximately 2 million hectares of forest is burned. That is the same as burning an area which is four times bigger than the famous Bali Island. And we can clearly imagine how clearly disruptive this is for the, for the biodiversity and also its natural habitat. And not only that, it also has caused this much devastating amount of financial loss of our economy. It also increased the health risk from, from the air pollution and from the smoke. And not to mention also the decrease in natural resources which can actually be used for food, housing, and medicine. And now we move on to case studies in, in other countries, which is Brazil and the USA. In Brazil, as the country which has the most extensive rainforest in the world, they surely have implemented policies to protect the rocky forests, especially the Amazon. And so in 1965, they created a law to protect 35 to 80 percent of land for native vegetation. This is to protect its originality and also to preserve its biodiversity. But one obstacle that was faced back then was that the difficulty for them to monitor the whole area because of the massive size. But since that, but as technology improves and also more policies emerges, in 2010 there was a new law where there's a new law where rural properties are, are public to be mapped and registered in order for them to be you know, for them to allow more effective monitoring and also allow restoration for different areas. Well, in the USA, there was actually a time when companies used to be able to throw their waste as much as they want, creating an uncontrollable amount of pollutants that were released into the waterways. But since the, but since the Clean Water Act of 1972, in 1977, the, the government can, can make the basic foundation for them on how pollutants or how pollutants can be released into the waterways. They also strengthen the permissions and also the requirements before companies can actually release them. This policy has proven to be effective since sanitary conditions improve from there. And in conclusion, these two case studies show how positively compelling it is if we can involve influential stakeholders by them doing the right actions on this kind of matter. Now, the next one is my family, but I want the possible solutions. solutions uh, that we think are essential in the road to solving the environmental problems you have mentioned earlier. First, uh, we think that raising awareness, wait, how, can we, how can we together as a community solve this problem if perhaps uh, parts of the community remain ignorant to it? That's why raising awareness is a, an important uh, part in the journey to saving our environment. We propose uh, raising awareness through social media
media, news reports, uh, and, and to campaign the information. So we can uh, emit environmental values in the people who get this information through social media and through these campaigns. Secondly, uh, environment, enforcing the law of our environmental regulations. Yes, we have these regulations, but what's the point of these laws if we don't enforce them? That's why uh, Indonesia should, o should also enforce the environment environmental laws that they have, such as uh, holding people accountable by, for the ones who start illegally starting fires or doing uh, illegal logging. Finally, we think uh, international cooperation is uh, an important it's important as well because two heads are better than one. And if we can work together with other countries to solve our problem, our problems, that will also affect them uh, positively, then why not? Uh, finally, with these measure solutions, we hope that the fundamental right for a safe and healthy environment could be achieved in this generation and generation. And that concludes our formal presentation, and now let us present to you the three most frequently asked questions regarding the topic of environmental protection. The first question is, how do we balance economic development and environmental sustainability? The second question is, what exactly is the cost of protecting the environment? And lastly, who do you think is responsible for pollution, the government or the society? We invite fellow delegates to think and reflect on these questions based on the current environmental conditions in your country. And these are the sources that we used in the making of this presentation. And with that, we thank you for your attention. And now we will entertain your questions. Regarding universal law, like you stated, or uh, you that you believe that universal law would cater to every country's needs, considering the fact that, um, like the examples that you gave, your case studies that U.S. and Brazil themselves develop independent policy. So, do you believe universal law would be a better option than independent law? So my question is, do you believe that universal law is better than a country independently taking care of it, making decisions about its own law or environmental protection? Um, to clarify your question, um, are you trying to say, are you asking that if US, US's law is better than any country's specific own uh, regulations for protecting the environment? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know how international organizations have certain standards for all countries, so do you believe that if it would be better if Indonesia would specifically set standards for Indonesia, which obviously concentrated on their own issues, or would it be better if it goes under the umbrella of a world organization setting that standard? That's if that happens. could have their own standards because the problems that we face uh, could not also be the same in other countries, but we can also join in in uh, an, another uh, an umbrella standard, such as uh, this, such as the UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, Indonesia also joins that, but at the same time, we also have our own standards. Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the emergency Paris Agreement. 
Um, and as you are such a major player, and especially when it comes to pollution, and one of the problems with pollution is that it's more than just going down for the UK, we do a lot. It doesn't actually affect us, it affects Norway and Sweden, so why it's not? Um, so I'm curious as to how to ensure that countries like the US or any other is going to be able to do. with many countries agreeing of a certain a period of time for that agreement. And we also agree that it's better to have quality over quantity, which um, what, we, what we want to say is that it's better to have a small number of countries who agree to do like, that have, that have, that has one goal, other than having lots of countries that have other countries Social 
Moreover, an increasing number of political refugees coming to Europe has been observed. This raises the question of how countries are able to balance their local authority efforts. In the last few years, uh, the number of migrants crossing borders in search of a new haven has grown exponentially. Uh, primarily political refugees and economic migrants, uh, they have been a source of conflict and fear in their host countries. In many countries, political parties have been blaming them for the economic and social issues uh, their receiving country is facing, often spreading fake news in order to pay the votes. Um, the relatively recent events caused by Islamic terrorism have been used as a tool to create fear and confusion uh, in the minds of the people. Populism and the rise of a far-right ideology have been very clearly seen, for example, in uh, the 2016 campaigns for the U.S. presidential elections, uh, when the current president, Mr. Trump, spent his entire campaign stirring up hatred and exaggerated uh, nationalism. Uh, this also happened in France uh, during the 2017 presidential elections, where um, the far-right party, uh, the National Front, stood for the second time in history uh, in the second round of the elections, eventually losing with 33% uh, of the popular vote. So, do you guarantee for millions of migrants, nationals of any of the United States, that since work and living conditions differ a lot uh, between the East and the West, the West is very more attractive to, to people because it's more the not, and people might tend to migrate there to find better opportunities and religion. Western uh, workers who come to work for a short amount of time create a better conditions in these countries because they are paid for their work, but all social contributions are made in the West. So let's talk about the social exclusion that workers and other arrival. Their language and cultural differences often keep them uh, from being integrated properly in the host country. Isolated and because of mutual mistrust with the locals, they tend to work with and cause all of the communities according to ethnic and cultural identities. Uh, this graphic actually shows how uh, the median weekly earnings of immigrants and labor workers. Um, so you can clearly see that um, immigrants uh, get a lesser wage than native born workers. And then the second graphic uh, shows a uh, uh, breakdown by economic sector of the groups of workers in the union. <laughs> A 
at uh, 8.9 in 2018, uh, because um, potential workers are not qualified enough for the jobs. In 2017, over two, 250,000 jobs are filled. So, not many foreign workers are uh, here to compete with the nationals and those who are here are only the one willing to feel for entire jobs. So our second case study will be hunger. We can see that the order hunger population sorry are a clear example of the way diamondization of foreign corridors, essentially refugees which are depicted as terrorists and the spread of fake news in order to obtain the proper support. Sorry. The Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, is the leader of the military and conservative party. His policies include control of the press and the construction of the outline wall of the Serbian and Croatian shared borders in 2015. The testimony of Fazal, a political migrant uh, from Afghanistan, will help us to understand better. He first went to Hungary to have European papers, but had a lot of difficulties to get them. He was in prison for six months, so not in the future month, but in the present year. Uh, to finally get his resident permit for five years. Uh, he got a job thanks to an organization, but due to his lack of diploma, he had a low salary. After his diploma, no wage change. That's a problem, because most of the buses want them to work on the black market. But there are no place, place left and no proof of their work. They can't be integrated into society and no, no literal um, of the residents. Still, Hungary faces a major issue. Most of the <coughs> workforce lives in country abroad uh, for the EU for the most part. The wage is due to three times higher in Western Europe for Western workers. Indeed, the country is now 9,818 million of inhabitants, and 5,000 have already left, uh, 500,000, sorry, have already left, most of them for work done. Moreover, the giant of the population and the low birth rate will reinforce the position. Consequently, the country lacks labor force, especially in public buildings and work sector, and in the manufacturing industry due to cross border workers and low salaries. Some companies subsequently have to deploy orders. There are between uh, 100,000 and 200,000 vacant jobs. It is two to four times more than officially estimated by the government. Hungary also faces the great rate. Now we get to one minute to wrap up. Um, our third case study is Italy. So Italy's struggling economy has played a major role in the last um, 2018 elections. Uh, the country's public debt as a percentage of the gross domestic product is roughly of 130% and the unemployment rate of 10.9% as of February 2018. In addition to that, Italy has received over 600,000 migrants over the last four years. This issue created a climate favorable for the right of far-right populist parties, and as a result of the coalition between the Five Star Movement and the cent and a center-right alliance, Giuseppe Conte was appointed prime minister. During their campaigns, the populists relied, among other things, on the rising anti-migrant sentiment. Uh, however, Italy presents the same issues as Hungary as to the aging of the population. The average age uh, in the country is 46 years, years old, whereas in 1970 it was a 32.8 years old. Uh, the immigrated population is younger and more active than the Italian one, and has therefore a major role in maintaining a strong and efficient retirement income system, and at the same time a social security system. However, far from hurting the Italian economy, my immigrants have uh, a positive influence on it. While the Italian government depicts them simply as a burden, according to a study conducted by the Leone Moresa Foundation from 2017, the 2.5 million undocumented immigrants, uh, workers accounted for on the territory, have produced 131 of the 1,670 billion euros of the Italian GDP, or about 9% of the wealth created. The delegation of funds due to the shortening of time have to cut you off from your presentation. Can we have a round of applause to the delegation? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Ian from the United States. Uh, great presentation. I have one question. Can you tell us about your signatures? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
and it's basically meant to um, condemn the unfair competition and improve the woman's life in the US sector. We also have another solution, which is Erasmus, which is a European program, which integrates students in European uh, other university. So the solution here is that students are integrated since they are studying. So they have friends, they know the language, they also know the culture. So it's better for them. They don't know the racism that other people can know if they go you know, after that study when they are older. Thank you for your question. Can we have another question? Um, anyone else would like to ask a question as we would like to give our delegates a chance? If there are no other delegates that would like to pose a question, then we will give them a chance. Okay. Um, Okay, so thank you delegates of France. Following that, we have the delegates of India to present to us their topic, tackling the inequality gap, balancing meritocracy and social welfare. So, will you guys tell us if we are on the way to the last? Did you just have to ask you hear us? So that we, we thought we'd be able to walk around a little bit if we not use mine. So, can you guys hear us? Yeah. 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 Can the future chaperones hear us in the back? Yeah. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Dhruv Tiyagi and uh, my, my fellow delegate is uh, Aditi, Aditi Singh. So we are Saad, Pelia Karupan, Venkar and Aditya. We are representing Team India and we will be presenting to you now. So to introduce our topic, I'd like to start off with a quote by uh, Bernie Sanders, a famous uh, Democrat in the United States. And I quote, a nation cannot survive morally or economically if so few have so much while so many have so little, unquote. And so I'd like to introduce our topic, tackling the inequality gap, meritocracy, balancing meritocracy and social welfare. For the purpose of our presentation, we've highlighted the aspects we'll be talking about in red. So we'll talk about the inequality gap, meritocracy and social welfare. To talk about inequality, we have out there. So I'm going to start off by explaining what income inequality actually is. So it actually refers to the extent to which income is distributed unequally in our society today. So income inequality or the gap between the rich and the poor has been increasing in the recent past. For example, a, a survey conducted in the United States by UC Berkeley concluded that income uh, disparities have become so pronounced nowadays that America's top 10% 
now average more than nine times as much as the bottom 90 percent. So now moving on, to get a deeper understanding of the topic at hand, we need to look at the roots. So inequality was always prevalent in the 16th and 17th century as well, but when it really accelerated was post the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution basically saw uh, numerous agrarian economies turning into manufacturing economies in the late 1760s till, till about 1840s. So to get an idea of the current situation, we have two of these graphs. So these graphs show that how the wages are increased in the 18th century post the Industrial Revolution and how consequently the uh, income gap between the rich and the poor has also increased. This is basically due to uh, the fact that the rich got a cut of their income while unfortunately the poor did not. Now moving on to the causes of inequality, I am just going to mention a few. So first of all, the poor systems of taxation whereby the government does not avoid inequality but rather redistributes it among society because of its regressive taxation policies. Secondly, the introduction of technology in our society today has led to innumerable workers with factory jobs getting replaced by machines. Now lastly and more, most importantly for me, improper understanding of gender roles and social injustice. So how many of you guys are feminists? Okay, so... This has led to a somewhat imbalance and um, incorrect stru structure in our society today where women are not given the same advantages as men are. And now this is just to name a few and now I would like to call up very So as of now we have heard what the inequality gap is. So what are our solutions to it? The best that we have right now and something that is worked pretty famously for us in the recent years <coughs> is one meritocracy which is a system which believes in selecting people based on merit and it does not take their background or any other aspect in consideration only their merit. While social welfare on the flip side of the coin is something that um, ex is something that is used to uplift a person due to his due to the fact that they do not have the same privileges as their peers in the same in the same grade or in the, in the same age group or in a different country. So meritocracy, what is it? It is a system that is best suited to the most talented and most innovative. Where did it all start? And like my fellow delegate did state, we have to go out to the roots. It started back in Napoleon's time when Napoleon Bonaparte decided that no, that handing down a position should be done by aristocracy or by heritable lineage. It should be done through the system of merit. A person is given a post based on what he does or what he has done. So why is it so appealing? First things first, it puts the most is to put it puts the most pro appropriate person in the position. Number one. Number two, it incentivizes performance. So if a person completes one target, it pushes the person to complete another target by incentivizing it with a little extra wage or a little extra push in moral support. Moving on, and as these two aspects do work, it also endorses efficiency and eventually yeah, helps strengthen the econ economy of the country. So, an example of meritocracy would be Sundar Pichai. He's, he is a man who graduated from Manipal Institute of Technology, moved on to Google, and from there proved his merits through his, through his various strategies that he created through the various um, to the various roles that he played in the company. Now I'd like to talk about a man who is not, who is an inspiration not only to me, but also to millions of Indians. My name is Singh Dhoni. Now he started off from a very simple background. He had, he did not have much money, but it just goes to show, he, and now he's one of the most famous cricketers and most successful cricketers in the world. It just goes to show how meritocracy actually works in our country and how we are able to give opportunities to the most to the most capable to rise up to this position in society. Now while meritocracy sounds perfect to pick the best man for the job, there's also very pitfalls. Even though it seems all okay, we do not take background into account. Now while it seems like it's okay not to take background into account, as illustrated by this cartoon, there are certain individuals who are more privileged and hence can meet certain standards much easier than other individuals who have not received the same amount of resources as these previous individuals have. I will be elaborating on this later, but first and foremost we will be introducing Surya to speak about social inequality. So as my fellow delegates have said before, 
inequality is exist in both social and economic strata in society in, in the world everywhere right this is a very prevalent issue now so um, so i would i want to move forward to talk about social welfare so why do we need social welfare it is because of these inequalities so uh, a good way to gauge how a society is doing and how we are functioning is by asking the people how happy they are by looking at the happiness index and also asking them what social welfare schemes and programs they have so a uh, an individual in need or even a family in need can uh, benefit from social welfare schemes and that's one of the most important merits of social welfare so um so here uh, uh, so moving on we talk about how social welfare benefits one of the most important uh, parts of society which is the children now the children are the future of the world the future of the country right so by educating the children with the help of social welfare schemes what we're doing is we're uh, securing our future we're making sure that development occurs in the future so um, lastly i would like to say that uh, social welfare is uh, not just benefiting those who are underprivileged those who are in the weaker sections of the society on the whole it's going to benefit the entire society very simple why because if i am educating a weaker section of society what's going to happen is it's going to improve their productivity it's going to improve their efficiency now so we have to talk about the inefficiencies of social welfare so uh, so the inefficiencies of social welfare are that um, when when um, uh, uh, basically if you're given social welfare if you're given a position of uh, because of certain reason because of uh, the fact that you belong to a certain community that is not your privilege there is a possibility that your productivity and efficiency will decrease Okay, there is a possibility that you may become lazy. You may become uh, dependent on those social welfare schemes. So, uh, social welfare, even though it is important, there is a flip side. There are disadvantages because if, uh, say, uh, uh, a person is becoming less productive and less efficient, um, the economies of the entire country is also suffering. So, um, to conclude, I'd like to say that every topic there is a flip side. There are advantages and disadvantages. Now I'd like to give you a very short analogy. Think of life as a race, and meritocracy and social welfare as two forms of race. So meritocracy, while it does award those who finish first, it forgets to take into account that certain people might have a head start in life, certain people might have better shoes to run. What do you think about social welfare? While it does aim at the upliftment of the downtrodden, what it does is it basically awards a gold medal to everyone who participated in the race regardless of whether they deserve it or not okay so social welfare and meritocracy coexist right they are inter independent of one another now as most physics phenomena work these are opposing forces because while meritocracy alone engenders excessive competition but it also puts forth the best man for the job now while social welfare uplifts those who are under in a lower strata of society it also might dis incentivize people to work hard right so what indian government or any government in the world today is aiming to do is simultaneously to get both social and economic development um, while most governments trust on large growth enhancement programs they also work on gradual subsidies in health and education um, to take it for india we have the mid day meal scheme reservation reservation refers to certain quota in in the government colleges of india which calls certain societies to have a certain percentage in that in that um, college which means that even if you get a certain lower level of marks because you do not have the resources to get attain the same amount of marks or have to stand in the same state of merit you still get admission into that college so that you are provided an equal opportunity as all of those who broke that privilege in the first place um furthermore there is also the mid day meal scheme the mid day meal scheme provides individuals one meal at 12 noon every individual in the government um, school gets provided this meal now it sounds like something small but in a country where the 65% of the population of 1.3 billion are in uh, below the poverty line there is something that incentivizes girl child and individuals all over the, uh, the country to go to school and create awareness and education and with that i would like to conclude our presentation thank you so much for for the inside whole presentation. Now we have a short Q&A. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, I have a question for you. I just want to ask, uh, what do you think affects um, how effective social welfare is? Like, does it depend on the individual or are there underlying factors? 
Could you just give me your question one more time? Sorry. Um, how would you think affects how effective uh, social welfare is? Is it the individual, like, because you said that is they could become complacent? Like, do you think it depends on the individual or are there other factors? So, uh, when you talk about social welfare, it's essentially aimed at the upliftment of, as I mentioned, the downtrodden in society, those who are not as privileged as certain other sections. Now the individuals make up that section of society, right? So it's kind of a, a codependent system. So how effective social welfare is? As stated by Aditi, the midday meal scheme. Now the midday meal scheme essentially has, a, uh, what it's aimed to do is to incentivize, is to provide an incentive to the children and the parents of these children to go to school by providing them a free meal every day. So in this, in this manner, what India tries to do with its social welfare schemes to make them most effective is to solve not only one small issue but an issue on the whole. A hunger is a very big issue in India, right? So with, with the midday meal scheme, uh, the government of India has aimed to solve the problem of hunger as well as providing education so that we can lessen the inequality gap. Um, furthermore, when you say that it, it is, it is a bit, uh, dependent on the individual, or this is See, obviously, there are certain individuals who are born with a certain level of privileges, right? If they're in the lower society or lower strata, then they do have to put in that hard work. That's what I'm emphasizing, that both of them are essential and equal. And if you do not put in that hard work, and if that complacency kicks in, then it could disincentivize a lot of individuals to put in that hard work in the first place. So it depends both on the individual and the society, if that answers. Shape it for the 
one thing, one thing that we should know is the success of a country in the current times is not what will determine the breakthroughs and glory of the country in the future. We have to focus on how well we prepare our citizens to ride on the new ways of change and sail confidently to becoming the top hitters of the future. In our presentation, we will dissect the sub theme the changing nature of education in the context of Singapore to better understand how our humble nation has taken steps in embracing change. We will split the presentation into two parts. Firstly, analyzing the shift in educational goals. And secondly, modifications on how education is being brought forth to our citizens, linking the idea of assessment, teaching, and learning together. The purpose of schooling now more than to fulfill our dreams, is to, is to chase our passions and realize our dreams. Back then, when our only focus was to, was to ensure that we had a stable income and a socially acceptable job, we have moved towards a more progressive society and a more uh, accepting society, where we focus now on, um, and where people more are more inclined, inclined towards having the autonomy to do what they genuinely want. Therefore, stressing and emphasizing the need of education to ensure that they have the necessary skill sets to do so. So in Singapore, it's mandatory for us to chase um, to study both arts and sciences. So by doing so, it means that we have to take assessment for these two aspects as well. So by doing this, it's to ensure that students will treat both arts and sciences seriously. And these will possibly change some prejudices they might have against a certain aspect in the first place. So, Doing this will give them broad range of opportunities to develop skills in different areas and to allow them to find their passion in these different aspects as they have more time to really go and explore these two aspects of education. And as such, you can see why education is imperative in today's world. And let's use Singapore as an example. Singapore is a meritocratic society, so well, you read what you sow. And let's say I come from a low income family. Okay, so I have no control over that. But what I do have control over is my ability to get education and if I can work hard, okay, I will be able to bring out a best of my cycle of education, occupation and a low, and a low income starting family. Okay, so realistically, employers still value results and like, let's say the prestige of your, of your applicant school. So let's say if I work hard, through my own individual effort, I'll be able to bring out this cycle. The 19th century saw the start of public education and has been mainly focused on rote learning. The key to acing examinations is just regurgitating the information in a textbook, which is of little value by the time one enters the workforce. Such a seed may sound familiar to some of us, as a large majority of schools still adopt this practice to educate children. While the times have changed, the education system in most parts of the world have not save for a few exceptions. For instance, the International Baccalaureate Program in Singapore has been receiving greater acceptance in recent years. It strays away from the typical learning styles of government schools by assessing students on their critical thinking skills. Similarly, Singapore's Republic Polytechnic also uses problem-based learning where students have to solve real-world problems. No longer will students see this subject in isolation but rather how they can be used for a greater purpose. Another example would be New Zealand with their Think New Initiative. They will use the nominal based learning to study, quite similar to Singapore's problem based learning. The curriculum will include thinking about future problems such as sustainability to ensure that students are aware of global issues. By organizing projects and also placing an emphasis on soft skills, the students are well equipped to become global citizens. Finland is a country that is very well known for its holistic education and it has plans to combine subjects to study such that students will not see subjects in isolation but rather apply topics from various areas. Currently, 70% of the teachers are already integrating phenomenal based learning into their lessons. This ensures that the younger generation can put what they learn in school into their daily lives. It is said that education is a passport to the future but tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Education is not a 10-year, 20-year investment, but instead a lifelong journey. Hence, there is a need to provide quality education for our young generation to realise their full potential, especially for a small city like ours, which only has a human talent pool as our natural resource. Singapore is a tiny red dot on this globe, barely has any natural resources, 
and relies heavily, heavily relies on imported water and food to keep our nation going. With a gradually aging population of 5.6 million people condensed in just 719 square kilometers, it is the people living here that keeps our nation going. The Singapore education system tries to ensure that every child has the opportunity to learn through its compulsory education act. The financial assistance scheme is also given to, to, uh, to families facing financial difficulties so as not to deny any child the opportunity uh, to, go to, to go to school. The Singapore education is being brought forth to our citizens to three main, to, 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 uh, through the idea of teaching, learning and assessments with the help of teachers in school and parents at home. This is the typical way of learning in Singapore. Teachers will hold lectures and lessons with students in school. With such interactive learning and project works, students can gain knowledge. With assessments, students can then consolidate their learning and teachers have a better gauge of students' understanding on the subjects. Teachers can also use the assessments to guide the students and track their improvements. Students, on the other hand, can gain feedback and learn from mistakes. This forms a cycle with major assessments such as primary school leaving examination all the way to the GCE A levels and university degrees. Just as students grow from the primary to secondary to the tertiary level, the learning becomes more and more self-directed. However, should proficiency in education be solely dependent on assessment? This has been a controversial topic. Many argue that assessments allow the students to take on a deeper understanding of what they're learning, while others say that assessments add extra stress as well as encourage peer competition. And that detracts from the original purpose of education, which is to allow the students to acquire a deeper passion for learning. With this in mind, the Singapore education system has carried out appropriate changes, such as the reformation of the primary school leaving examination, which every child sits for at age 12. If we reflect from 2020, it will move away from relative aggregate scores to grading bands so as to reduce competition among students and focus on holistic learning. This is emblematic of the direction that the Singapore education system is trying to move in in terms of focusing on holistic education through outdoor experiential learning and service learning opportunities. We believe that in order for our system to thrive, resources have to be set aside for our youth. Well, some money has to be set aside for the continual development of workers as well as the upgrading of the elderly's skill sets in order to keep up with the times, it's imperative that the focus be put on the youth. It is only when this is done that we will be able to have a generation of innovative leaders that will not only balance the workforce, but also be the driving force to a new and bright future. In Singapore, we can observe a gradual shift in the priorities and methodologies of education, namely in the greater emphasis of holistic education and hands-on learning, as opposed to older schools placing an emphasis solely on academic grades. As changes in the world we live in a force, we live in a force educators to rethink entire, rethink entire pedagogies. Education systems are also increasingly geared towards empowering students to be the disruptors of tomorrow. This special relationship is task one that has to be constantly assessed and revealed to best develop the next generation of citizens. Finally, here are some food for thought in terms of education as a policy objective. Singapore's history demonstrates to us that education systems are often shaped by the geopolitical conditions of a country. So for instance, in Singapore's early post-independence years, we had to focus on math and sciences to build up economic industries quickly. And, this, and, the question, and we didn't think about whether education systems necessarily always have to reflect the times that the country finds itself in, as well as the situations and the needs that it has. Additionally, with a greater focus internationally on, issue, on issues of privilege as well as structural social economic inequalities, how can education systems account for these differences and level the playing field for students who might be more disadvantaged? And from an individual level, of course, some of us in society don't learn as well within, as ex, within existing frameworks of teaching. And it's through this, and through the discovery of the uniqueness of these now, of these children, we are able to come up with programs like gifted programs for gifted students or having a greater awareness of different learning techniques or different learning abilities. But two questions. First, how do we ensure that our identification of these students give accurate results? And second, how can we continue to help and further develop these students to reach their full potential? With that, we can see that education plays a pivotal role in shaping our future. And our education system needs to continue to develop to meet the, need, to meet the needs of the people of tomorrow. With that, we end our presentation and we thank you for your attention. Here are some of our research references.
Oh, UK, sorry, UK. Um, so I spoke really good presentation, very well done. Um, I would like to ask, um, you showed how Singapore has successfully implemented like teaching names of education to allow um, all schools to benefit the population. But what do you think that other countries, such as the South Korea, where I come from, um, are lacking that fail to implement these changes effectively? Um, because, as, as you might know, Korea has um, a lot of focus on memorization. Um, thank you very much. So, I think with regards to this, it's important to realize that Singapore, in, some, in many ways, is a special case. So, the, the first reason would be because of our size, for instance, and operationally and administratively, it's quite easy to see that, like with a smaller country, it's much easier to get things done. And in fact, I think um, from the discussions that we've had recently, I think we also know, we also begin to realize that our education systems are slightly different, both in terms of how quickly you can op like, implement a new system that you want that you want to implement, as well as how much control and regulation that ministries of education, for example, have over schools in different countries. So I think that's one factor that will affect like, where, how fast educational reforms can be. But on the second level, I think it's also worthwhile to consider the, um, the opportunities and the potential of certain international programs, so things like the IEP program, or even things like um, the advanced placement of AP classes, which are being held in several countries. So even if change can't necessarily be affected, if I, like, be, be put in quickly from the, from the top down, at least like, different countries can follow certain standardized international models to see where they can do their curriculum from. And it's a true implementing and adapting these to local systems that you get the best results. So for instance, while not every school does the IEP in Singapore, we have our own modified version which we call the IEP, which is the integrated program that much on is part of, for instance. Yeah. So I hope this is good. We have the teacher at the back. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I, I had one brief question, which was you said that New Zealand was the best for, for preparing students for later life. And I wondered um, how that had been measured and how that had been assessed and where, where um, who had done that assessment. Because there must be lots of different ways to come up with a metric for that. And I wondered what had been used. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, I wondered how you. How, what, what metric has been used to assess the best nations of preparing, uh, who, the nations whose education system was the best for preparing students for the life? Thank you for your question. Uh, due to a shortage of time, we'll only have about one minute to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, thank you for your question. I think, honestly, like, there, isn't a, like, there doesn't necessarily have to be a one size fit all metric. I think, um, like with regard to what we put as the first discussion, first question for discussion, it's often down a lot to the individual needs of the country. But at the same time, I think there are with a greater awareness and discourse over what are established educational techniques and pedagogies to teach children and students. There's also a greater awareness of certain methods that might be not as effective or might be outdated, especially in today's world, where you know you don't need necessarily need to memorize everything since every like since you can access all of outside of the so I think empirically there could be some things that education systems all over the world can agree on to be more beneficial for students. Things like developing class skills and survival skills, as well as like interaction skills. But at the same time, it's important to tailor these to individual students. Yeah. Um, so like regarding how we access, basically our group looked into like the test that we all do, which is PISA, P-I-S-A, that a lot of regions do actually. And so what we test the students on is how well they're able to apply knowledge like science and math and reading onto questions that are shown onto the computer. And within a fixed time, how well these students are able to perform under that kind of situation. And New Zealand appear at one of the top as well as Singapore as well. Yeah, so that's how we access and that's one of the platforms that we do access. Yeah. Thank you to the delegation of Singapore. Can we now give another big round of applause to all the countries that presented tonight?